Well, good morning. Welcome. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July. And it looks like all of our visitors are the members of the chapel visiting uh, their destinations. And I think Mark Newman is enjoying 70 degree weather up in Rhode Island today. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to fill in. This morning, our text is found in Hebrews chapter 4. Really a, a mountain peak text from verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And here we have, in a sense, a climactic summary highlighting what the inspired writer has already introduced briefly. And in another sense, a great foundation in which he builds and expands in the largest section of the book of Hebrews, all the way through chapter 10, verse 18. I like how John Owen put it concerning our text this morning. He writes, we have before us this ocean of spiritual truth and heavenly ministries, which we are now launching into. And therefore we do most humbly implore the guidance and conduct of that good and Holy Spirit who has promised unto us to lead us in all truth. For who is sufficient for these things? Indeed, this is the word of God. So let's go into it this morning. Hebrews chapter 4 from verses 14 and 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May God bless his word this morning and our time in it together. <clears throat> this past Thursday across the country, we all celebrated Independence Day for our nation. No doubt its significance is fresh in your minds. Um, I'm sure you reflected on the freedoms we enjoyed uh, with your family, perhaps. You flew the flag, uh, you enjoyed some fireworks, and you likely reflected on the cost of that freedom that we enjoy as a nation. 248 years ago, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted. 56 delegates to the Continental Congress signed their names to the Declaration. Mutually, they pledged, as that Declaration closed, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. A, mit, a litany of abuses had led to that point. It reached a boiling point. And the heart of that boiling point was the idea of representation or lack thereof among the colonies. That revolutionary era, the American colon, colonial slogan was taxation without representation is tyranny. This isn't a civic lesson. But from a national governance standpoint, people yearn for good representation. We want faithful representatives to go, go for us, to be our voice, to intercede on our behalf when needed. And we certainly feel the frustration when that doesn't exist, um, when that's not the case. And yet, from an earthly governance standpoint, even the best of earthly representatives in a national government are bound to disappoint and frustrate. Their office is not permanent, and indeed in their conduct, they don't represent us perfectly, do they? And that is if where our hope, if that is where our hope lies, it is a futile hope. Um, vanity of vanities, as the writer of Ecclesiastes um, would say, all is vanity, not so from an eternal and heavenly governance standpoint. 
Praise be to God, we have a superior, an everlasting representative who has gone before us to make intercession on our behalf and who continually, exceed, uh, uh, continually intercedes for us. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the inspired, inspired writer shines a spotlight to that reality, <clears throat> plumbing the depths of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, first in his person and in his work, in who he is, his nature and character, the supremacy of his work and what he has accomplished on behalf of his people. And the original believing Jewish reader greatly needed uh, to be encouraged and instructed um, in that. Jesus Christ is superior in every way. He is preeminent. He is the heir of all things, as the writer introduced. It was through whom, through him, from, from whom all the world was made. He is the radiance of God's glory, not reflecting his glory, but the radiance of his glory. He is very God of very God. And as God the Son, he radiates his own inherent glory. He is the exact representation. That is, he is the perfect imprint of divine nature bound up in him. He is the God-man. And by the word of his power, he upholds all things. For he has made a uh, full and per perfect purification of sins. And he has sat down at the right hand on the, of the majesty on high. That's the very first section of Hebrews in which we are introduced to the supremacy of Christ in those amazing terms. The inspired writer expands and continues. Jesus is superior to the angelic hosts from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4 through 2, 18. He's superior uh, to Moses in his work leading Israel through the wilderness from chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 13. And now the longest section of Hebrews continues on from, verses, from chapter 4, verse 14, where it's introduced and continues through chapter 10, verse 18. Christ is superior to Aaron, uh, the Aaronic priesthood. The entire priestly system of the Old Testament, Christ is superior. That is what the system pointed to, a greater priesthood. Uh, from, the, uh, from the priesthood of Melchizedek, uh, a kingly priest whose work is complete. From verses 14 through 17, summarizes what the inspired writers already laid out before us. And we have a great implication and application of these truths, these infinitely precious and deep truths to the Christian life um, in our walk with Christ. Uh, the application of the supremacy of Christ to our life is in twofold, <clears throat> twofold duty and a twofold encouragement. One, verse 14, to hold fast our confession, <clears throat> to hold fast our confession. And number two, in verse 16, to draw near, to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. First, in verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The writer introduces the verse with the word, therefore. Having therefore, or it can be rendered, seeing then that we have, or whereas therefore we have. The writer highlights and expands that which he's already introduced. And notice the idea of representation there. If you'll turn back to Hebrews chapter 2, from verses 4, I'm sorry, from verses 16, and we'll read through chapter 3, verse 2. And notice that idea of representation and intercession. For assuredly, he does not give help to the angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become 
a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Jesus has represented and interceded for his brethren in all things. He has made propitiation for the sins of his people, satisfying the wrath of God in full upon himself. And the divine writer is urging the reader, the believing Jewish reader, to consider Jesus. Not to consider him in a loose way, but to ponder him deeply. The apostle, uh, the sent one of God, um, supreme and superior, the high priest of our confession. This is what the reader has already confessed. And this is what they hold to. Uh, they have already acknowledged Christ. They have trusted in him. The writer instructs them to consider, consider him to look more closely into the infinite depths of this truth and what we have in Christ, our great high priest. What does it mean? We have the supremacy of Christ in his office as the great high priest. He is superior to Aaron. And we have the very person of Christ whose intercession is far greater than all the priests of the history of Israel's history, all the way to the, the chief priest, Aaron. Here is the great high priest, and he is our great high priest. He is ours. He belongs to us. We have him, and consider what he has done. He has passed through the heavens. Consider his identity here in chapter 4. He, the one who has passed through the heavens, he is Jesus, the Son of God. And what depths of doctrinal truth we have here before us. First, the Aaronic priesthood. In Exodus chapter 28, God commanded Moses to set Aaron apart and his sons to set them apart and all generations preceding uh, uh, descending from Aaron, set them apart from the people of Israel to serve the Lord God as priests. They had a design of priestly garments that were to be made and worn by Aaron and his sons. They were to be recognized in the service of their duty by what they wore um, as they served to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. The priesthood there was perpetual. It would never be fulfilled through the line of Aaron. From generation to generation, um, from Leviticus and Numbers, we see it expanded. Chief priests and high priests, a ranking order of the priests. Jesus only, the Son of God, is the great high priest. And it's highlighted even further in what he accomplished. He who ascended into the heaven passed through the heavens. Notice the verbiage there that he passed through the heavens. From one place to another, he passed through. Here, you'll notice the writer is not saying he passed into the heavens, but through the heavens. When you think of heaven, you can think of it in in a, a different senses. Um, consider heaven, we think of God's glorious throne where he reigns and resides, the resting place of the saints who find rest in heaven, um, whose faith was in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in heaven the Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God most high. He did not pass through heaven in that regard, um, but into heaven. We see that in 1 Timothy 
chapter 3, verse 16, where he went into the glories. Um, he sits at the right hand of God in Acts chapter 3, verses 21, until the restoration of all things. He reigns physically there. But that's not the heaven the writer has in mind here. Rather, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. The second meaning or the other meaning of heavens we see in Jesus' ascension um, through the heavens. He rose and ascended through the air. Um, he had offered up himself on the cross. He was buried and raised from the dead. And he ascended into the heavens, through the heavens, into the air. And in a sense, he passed through the heavens, the atmosphere of the heavens, um, through the vast expanse of space in which he holds the entire solar system together. He passed through the heavens, the galaxies, the universe, his grand handiwork. He passed through it all. And again, how this points us to the supremacy, the preeminence of the work of Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished. In Hebrews chapter 7, the writer inspired would continue in that thought. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He was made higher than the heavens, for he passed through them, and he is exalted above them, taken up to glory. That's an amazing thought, is it not? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Now, this expression, Paul writes, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. That's a glorious truth. The atoning work of Christ is seen fully accepted upon God the Father, not only in his resurrection, but in his ascension through the heavens. Christ was risen and he alone ascended through the heavens. He passed through the heavens. Who can say or make that claim? Only our great high priest. Consider the priest's work uh, there in the tabernacle, the Aaronic priests. They would enter the tabernacle out of the sight of the people um, who remained in the courts. The priest would enter through a veil uh, through the courts uh, and enter into the holy place. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 17, when he goes, that is the priest, when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. And the priest, once a year, would go in further still. He would pass through and into the inner room, passing through a veil into the holy of holies to make atonement and intercession in the most holy place uh, for, on behalf of the people. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. There were many pieces of furniture there within the tabernacle, within the holy place, and within the holy of holies. But the priest's work was never finished. Year after year, he would pass through out of the sight of the people to do his work, um, to intercede uh, for the people. And there was furniture there, an altar, horns. Uh, there was no chair. There was no chair in the Holy of Holies because the work of the Aaronic priesthood would never be fulfilled and accomplished and satisfied. It was a reminder. The wages of sin is death, and blood was required. But the blood of a lamb, even a spotless lamb, would never be sufficient. It required a sacrifice, a greater lamb, the Lamb of God, 
who is the person and work of Jesus Christ, which he accomplished. Sinless, he offered up himself as the chief high priest. He was the chief high sacrifice once and for all. And there in the Holy of Holies sits the Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God Most High. His work complete, his sacrifice superior, provided once and fully effectual for all who trust in him, for his people. He passed through the heavens, and now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's the person of our great high priest. He continues, who is this great high priest? It's Jesus, the Son of God. In that very simple sentence, we, the writer emphasizes both his humanity, his deity. He is Jesus. He has a name above every name. He was born of a virgin, given the name Jesus. The emphasis, he is the Son of God. Uniquely, the only begotten. By name, Jesus. By relation to God the Father, he is God the Son. Unique. We were talking this week with the girls of the, the meaning of the name Jesus. God is salvation. Yeshua. Um, the Hebrew version of Joshua. It's likely what Mary called him. Probably sounded a lot more like Joshua. Um, uh, the Lord is salvation. He was to save his people. The angel declared in Matthew 1, 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus for, for or because he shall save his people from their sins. The work of Christ and the person of Christ bound up in who he is, the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. He is the eternal Son of God, begotten, not made. Very man, fully man, and very God of very God. So let us hold to that profession, to that confession, the confession of the work, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our confession of the gospel is a verbal confession. Our faith is a vocal faith. Let us hold fast to our confession. Our confession and our faith in that person and work of Jesus Christ. This is the third time now that the writer has introduced that instruction to hold fast. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and boast in our hope firm unto the end. A second time in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. The Jewish believer here, the original audience, had confessed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were some who were suffering for it. The repetition of the command reveals the circumstance in which they faced. They had need to hold fast, to hold firm, that confession, as they confessed Christ, they began to experience opposition, mounting opposition, abundant opposition. Persecution that they would face would only intensif intensify. They were tempted to shrink back to the old way of Judaism under the law, and it seemed easier at that point. Their life was easier then. For now, they were being arrested for bearing the name of Christ, their confession. Their possessions were being taken, confiscated. But they haven't yet suffered to the point of shedding of blood, which would come. They were being pressured and, attempted, and tempted to abandon the one who they professed and confessed. And perhaps many among them who claimed to be among them had done that, revealing that they were never truly of them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, But we are not those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith and to the preserving of the souls. How do we hold fast to our confession? Faith being the root and obedience, 
the fruit, as John Owen um, well wrote, for unto faith is added obedience. We say that all throughout the scripture, faith and obedience in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and obedience in the prophet and the priest and the king, the supreme mediator of a greater covenant. By words, a spoken faith. Romans 10, 10, we have the heart, uh, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. But with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, he, whoever believes in him, will not be disappointed. By works, consistently and confidently, uh, in obedience, the fruit of faith. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's repeated all throughout John and in 1 John. The bent of one's life, holding fast. Uh, the tenacious holding of the confession. That's what the idea is here. Tenaciously holding the treasures of Christ as superior. Um, that's what we have here below um, uh, in our text this morning. To hold fast to what you already have. Um, to that which is superior. The affections of Christ. Holding fast to Jesus, the Son of God. And certainly, we are held fast by him. Are we not? We are held secure and fast in the hands of the Son, in the hands of the Father. We are secure. And we are empowered and enabled to hold fast to that confession. And look at who he is for us. He passed through the heavens, but he is not so highly exalted as our representatives often go and forget those for whom they represent. Not so in Christ, perfectly. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Yet without sin. What an amazing thing that we have a sinless Savior who sympathizes perfectly with the human condition, with all our weaknesses. He was tempted in all things and yet without sin. A sin is the basis of the need of our representation. Uh, we have a representative when we are born. The first Adam is our perfect representative in that in his fall, we sinned all. By the fall and revolt of Adam, Calvin wrote, the whole human race was delivered to the curse and degenerated from its original condition. That's the original, original sin. The doctrine of original sin, Calvin continues. Therefore, sin seems to be hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature, diffused into all parts of the soul, which makes us liable to God's wrath and also brings forth in us those works which the scriptures call works of the flesh. We don't need to be trained in those works. It comes naturally. Uh, for we, by nature, are fallen. That's our total depravity. Not one part of our being remains untouched by sin and corruption of sin. But here in Christ... We have the superior representative who represented man perfectly, fallen man perfectly, all who have faith in him. We need no lesser magistrate, uh, magistrate in God's kingdom. No other representative will do for those who have sinned. There is only one who is sinless, and that is Christ. In him we have the perfect sinless King. He reigns supreme. And we have a symp sympathetic great high priest who we have direct access through Christ to God the Father. And he sympathizes with our weakness. That's an amazing thought. He is not too high and esteemed, but he sympathizes with his children. He sympathizes with all who trust in him. He sympathizes with the plight of men and women 
who belong to him. He sympathizes with his fellow brethren, his fellow mankind. He is fully man. And he, is, he was, sympathizes in all of our weaknesses. For he himself was tempted, tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. What a precious truth that is, but it can be so easily twisted. It doesn't mean that he experienced every single temptation for every single sin that every man, fallen man, has experienced. I doubt that he was tempted with alcoholism or various individual sins. What this means is here, he felt the full force of the temptation of sin, the full weight of temptation from both the world and the evil one. And there is no dimension of temptation and testing that he did not experience in his humanity in full. He bore it. He bore it all. He felt the full force of sin's temptation, yet without sin. He was superior and supreme and sovereign over sin and conquered sin and death in his very being. It points to the deity of Christ. He cannot sin in his de deity. Um, and he has compassion for his fellow brethren in his humanity. He grew in his humanity, in stature. He grew in wisdom. He experienced all the emotions that we have experienced. Joys and sorrows, sadness, um, anger. Yet, in all those things, uh, he remained pure, sinless, spotless. Our earthly representative, um, our earthly representatives grow out of touch with our experience, and they lose sight of the experiences of those whom they represent. But not so for him who intercedes on our behalf. Our heavenly representative is our fellow brother who represents us perfectly. He is still fully man. He is fully God, seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And he intercedes on our behalf. He understands, he sympathizes um, compassionately. Therefore, because of this great truth, he who intercedes on behalf sympathizes on our behalf with our weaknesses. So the great instruction here, the second great encouragement, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may have mercy, so that may, we may receive mercy and find grace to, the help, to help in time of need. Draw near to him who intercedes, who is exalted above all things, who has pass through the heavens, who intercedes continually, pointing to his work that was accomplished in full at the cross. Draw near with confidence. Um, I don't know what you're going through in life, but uh, so often our confidence is shaken in our experiences, in our fight against sin when we stumble, uh, or perhaps the circumstances of life beating us down, um, discouragements come. Um, we are to draw near to him, hold fast to our confession and draw near with confidence. We have all the confidence we need in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We draw near to him, to the throne of grace for what he has accomplished for us. All the gift of grace of his sovereign grace, we have. And we have a throne of grace, not of law, but of grace, lavished upon us. And all the treasures that we have in Christ are of grace. And through, by, at his throne, he reigns supreme. And we have ever reason to have confidence. And we find mercy in him, we find encouragement and grace and help in a time of need. In him who has compassion for his people, 
He is readily comes and he has already sent his Holy Spirit to abide in us. Um, our helper, uh, the, the Son has sent and the Father has sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to abide. And he provides abundant mercy and grace and help in our every time of need. We have confidence in that. We can have confidence. There is no other confidence than this, in him, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who we draw near to. We abide in him for he abides in us. We have in Christ a great representative who abides and intercedes on behalf of us, whose faith are in him, is in him. So we can sing with full confidence, um, as I'm sure these saints experienced. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, but he, my Savior, makes me whole. That is what Christ has done. His righteousness imputed to us, his work accomplished, and he sits interceding on our behalf. And we can sing with confidence and draw near to him in confidence and profess and confess him with all confidence. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Well, may this come at a great encouragement in the trials of life that you face. Apart from Christ, there is no other encouragement. There is no other hope. There is no intercession on behalf of sinners, but in Christ. There is no propitiation, no satisfactory atonement that had been made apart from the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we are still dead, but for his grace. Uh, look to him. Consider Jesus. Our great high priest, hold fast the confession of faith in which you confess with your mouth. Hold fast the confession of faith in your heart, the affections in Christ. Draw near with confidence to him. What an encouragement. What a blessing. We have one who will never abandon his people, one who holds us fast and steadfast in him. May God give us the grace to do just that, to hold fast and to draw near, for he is near. And eternally, we await that glory in which we see him face to face, where our faith shall be sight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, we thank you for these truths. We barely plumb the depths scratching the surface of uh, the implication here that we have a great high priest whose work is finished. What joy, what grace we have in him who went before us, who represented sinful men. That is what we are, ever dependent upon the work of your son who you gave freely, who himself, for the joy set before him, offered that sacrifice once and for all time, that we may have peace and rest and grace and mercy and help in our greatest need against sin and death. Our foe is vanquished, and in Christ we have confidence. Encourage the confidence of your people as we go from here, as we continue to exalt Christ in the ministry of the word, as we continue to reflect and remember the intercession that was made and the intercession that is continuing um, before you, there at your right hand, seated, your son, um, our brother, our supreme representative, the God-man. And it's in his name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.